Hey gamers, this is Liz Davidson from Beyond Solitaire, and today I want to show you how to solo Hoplomachus Origins. This is the third game in the Hoplomachus series, the first being Lost Cities, the second being Rise of Rome. This is also the smallest and most affordable one, and it comes with some very interesting solo trials that'll really challenge you in the solo game. The main premise of Hoplomachus Origins is that the three original cities from Hoplomachus the Lost Cities, El Dorado, Atlantis, and Xanadu, each have their own special arenas and ways of fighting. So instead of getting one really big neoprene mat that you stage all of your battles on, you actually get three, and each of them has its own win condition. On the Atlantis map, uh, basically you and your opponent will each have a tribute chip that you're trying to transport from one end of the arena to the other. So you need to transport your own tribute while blocking the opponents, which is a pretty cool challenge. In the Atlantis Poseidon's Folly arena, um, you are basically trying to defeat the enemy's leader and they are trying to defeat yours. So the first gladiator deployed on each side is the leader, which means that you can draft gladiators and deploy some normal gladiator as your leader rather than have a champion. And you can have all kinds of different strategic reasons for doing something like that. It's really interesting. And then Xanadu is very much like a king of the mountain kind of scenario where you are trying to be the first to get six arena points or wipe out the competition. So at the beginning of each round, much as with crowd favor in the very first game, you get an arena point for every one of these spots that you occupy. The first to six wins or one team can totally wipe the other one out. Hoplomachus Origins is a player versus player game. However, it also comes with these really great solo mode called the Solo Trials. The solo trials come with these two really handy instruction cards. Uh, basically for your moves, the rules in the rule book work fine, but to direct AI opponents, this is great information. So this tells you how to deploy them per arena. Uh, this will give you the solo play sequence and turn order. It will tell you how enemy units should use their skills, especially because unlike in previous games where you, know, you might be using something that's strictly for AI, like, a, like an arena beast, or a titan. Uh, these are normal. These can be normal gladiator chips in some situations that you're actually using against yourself. So there are guides for handling that. You also have these very helpful sets of priorities for city chips from different scenarios. So you know that Zanadian units move a certain way, units from El Dorado move another way, and Atlantis units move in a different way. And there are actual special instructions to help you make decisions about what the AI should do. It takes a lot of stress off as you're playing. This card gives you directions for movement for champions in the solo trials. This isn't that different from Rise of Rome where you would roll dice and then it would let you know how someone was supposed to move and hit. So that's pretty useful. And then the other side, of course, you have the actual list of solo trials. So this is the lineup. Um, these are actually pretty tough. They have levels 1 through 20, and the idea is that you're supposed to attempt to progress from 1 through 20, and then there are rules for how to do that. So you get two attempts to beat each trial. If you, let's say that I've beat trial 1, beat trial 2, beat trial 3, and then I have a hard time with trial 4, if I lose it twice, I have to go back to trial 3. Win that again and then keep going. So the idea is that you're supposed to work your way in sequence through these different trials. And we're gonna talk about this, but you actually draft for each of your solo trials and actually for this game. So we'll be drafting the gladiators for each challenge that we think are gonna be the best matches for that challenge. And a lot of the game is experimenting with different combinations of gladiators and trying to find out what's gonna work the best. And that's really half the fun, maybe more than half. So you have also challengers. So we know here we have drafting and arena rules. So for example, for trial one, which we're gonna set up just to show you how it works, we cannot draft Zanadian units or tactics, which means everyone from Xanadu is out. We also know there are challengers, Arik Boke and Korikos. We also know what arena we're in because there's a little chip right here that says Xanadu on it. So each of the trials tells you what arena you're in, what the rules are for drafting your, your gladiators, and who your challengers are going to be. So it's a very simple setup. So we know that our challengers are going to be Arik Boke, I think that's the right pronunciation, and Korikos. And we also know from these rules that these are the positions that they're going to take. 
So basically in order of the people who are listed as your challengers, the first person listed in this case, Arctic Book, is gonna go in this hex. The second, Cory Coast, is gonna be here. So placement is already settled for you in the solo trials. It's very easy to set up. So let's get that done. So here we are all set up based on what's in the card. Um, if you were having a hard time figuring out which hexes, the deployment hexes always have this nice little friendly blood stain on them. So it's easy to figure out where you're supposed to put people because you put them where the blood is. You will also notice that there's some health chips underneath our competitors. So Arik is going to have six because he has six health according to his chip. Korkos only has two but she's still pretty dangerous. Just to give you a quick review of Hoplomachus chip anatomy, this is your health marker next to the heart. This is the uh, attack range. Next to the swords, the green is a movement range. And one is a tactical range if you're using a tactic chip. You also will see that um, these are the dice that would be used in a basic attack. Arik also has an innate ability called parry. On the back of the rule book, there is a description of all the different abilities. So we can see that parry means that the unit ignores the first successful basic attack against him each turn. Oh man. So what we're gonna need to do is find gladiators with some good alternate attacks. Coricos is a little bit different. Um, she has two health, one um, attack range, but she can move three and she has a tactical range of three. She's also interesting because for her basic attack, she doesn't even roll. She just hits you for one, no matter what. She also has an ability called ready and an innate ability called true strike. Ready means that she's able to move and attack on the same turn that she's deployed. So that means that if we're using her in a future round, which we can, cause she's a green chip, in some cases she'll be on our side. Uh, she is able to move and attack on the first turn. So normally when you deploy a gladiator, they can't move or attack on the first turn. They need to just kind of sit there and orient themselves until it comes back around. But Coricos can just, she's ready to rock right away. She also has an innate ability called True Strike. So what we know is that basic units by, basic attacks by this unit can be used as alternative attacks. So in some cases where um, you have special abilities that, for example, enable that enable Arik to avoid a basic attack, that means that Coricos could still attack him because she has the ability to treat a basic attack as an alternate attack. So if you're paying attention to all that language, you find little loopholes that make it easier to beat your enemies. So here's the fun part, and this is where we assemble our team of gladiators to challenge those guys for that trial. So we know from the solo list that there is a draft limitation, which is that we cannot draft Xanadian units or tactics. Basically, Korakos is from Xanadu, and so none of the people from Xanadu are gonna be willing to fight her. So this column is just straight out. So now that those guys have all left traders, I can tr I can pick six of these chips, units or tactics, and then those will be the chips that I have access to for this trial. So we know that we're fighting on the Xanadu arena, which means that people are gonna be fighting for control of those point scoring spaces in the middle. So I'm gonna want guys who can get on those spaces hold those spaces and maybe push people off of those spaces so that we can keep them for ourselves and score those points. So here are the six chips that I've drafted from that whole group and that I've decided to try. So I picked a Centurion because he has the shove ability and it seems like it'd be pretty good to be able to push people off of those pedestals. Um, we have a Tactician. I thought that he might be a good cheap first move because he can run really quickly and right away and pop up onto the elevated areas so that he gets a point right off in the next round. I have a Spearman. I like that he has True Strike, which means that he can hit Arik even though Arik is uh, immune to basic attacks on the first one because True Strike allows his attacks to count as either a basic or an alternate attack. I also went with this attacker just because I like his retaliate ability every time somebody hits him. He's got Whirlwind, which is a totally decent alternate attack. He also has a range of two movement, which can get him right to the center of the action right away. I also like that this tactic is called Adrenaline. It increases a friendly unit's move range by one, which makes it easier to claim space in the middle of the arena. And I also wanted to take this tactic, Dodge, ignore all damage from basic and alternate attacks for one round, so that I can have one round where I know that someone's going to be able to ignore the onslaught and score a point. 
So turn structure in um, Hoplomachus Origins is very, very similar to the other Hoplo games. Basically you deploy, then you move, then you attack. And we're gonna go first, they're gonna go second. So I'm gonna go ahead and deploy my Centurion and I'm gonna put this adrenaline tactic on him. So when you deploy, you can play one gladiator, one tactic, or one gladiator and one tactic. I only have one other tactic, so that's not gonna happen too much. Um, so we're gonna go ahead and put this tactic chip under him and we're also gonna put some health chips. So see how these guys have blue health chips? We are gonna have red ones to distinguish that we are a different team. So my Centurion just popped out with four health chips and with um, his tactic that gives him some adrenaline. And now I'm gonna choose where to put him. I'm gonna go ahead and put him here. Let's do that. Have a run. So the Centurion's gonna go here. Hopefully he's gonna kind of run at these um, at these pedestals when he's able. However, when you first deploy a unit, they can't move and they can't attack. They just have a round where they kind of chill out for a second. So that was my whole turn and now it's on them. In order to move Arik, who is the enemy champion, I'm gonna roll these dice and they're gonna help us determine what he does. So let's see how he rolls. Okay, so Arik is going to do all the things that are on this card. So he is on the Xanadu arena. So the first thing he's gonna do, he's gotta hit on this green die. That means he's going to move. How is he gonna move, you ask? That is determined by the solo trials rules. So he's a Xanadu unit as well as, well as Arik and Kublai Khan. So they are the champions of Xanadu. So he's going to move towards a arena, an arena hex if that's not possible, he'll move towards the closest opposing unit and then towards the weakest opposing unit. So his priorities are in this order. So first he's gonna to move towards an arena hex, but he's also going to make a move that puts him closer to the closest opposing unit. So he may not necessarily go in the direction that you think he would. Like you can't send him further away from your guy and be like, well, he's still moving towards the closest arena hex because the point is for him to move to, towards the arena hex and towards you. So I think logically for him, he is gonna wanna go, well, he could go either way, because this is one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. So I can choose, let's put him here. That's his move. Um, he also got a hit on the black die. It says heave, heave the strongest opposing adjacent unit on an arena hex directly overhead if possible. So he cannot heave me off of anything right now because we aren't adjacent to each other. But in the future, that may be an issue. Um, he did not get a hit on the blue die, but if he had and we'd been next to him, he would do an arena knockback and push us all away from him. And the yellow die is a basic attack. There's no one for him to attack within his range anyway, but had it been a hit, that would have been what he got to do. So as you can see, the die rolls just determine what the champion does. It's something that works really, really smoothly in this game. Korakos is a normal unit, she's not a champion, but she's gonna have the same priorities that any Xanadu unit would. She's gonna get to an arena hex that also happens to be towards the closest opposing unit. So what that's gonna mean for her, since there's only one opposing unit right now, is that she's going, she has a range of three movement, but she's going to move here and she's gonna stop because she's reached her goal, which is to get on an arena hex. And if she can still be on one at the beginning of next round, these guys score a point. This is moving towards me, but she's not gonna move off of that hex at me. I'm gonna have to come get her off of there. So now it's us again. We can deploy someone new and the Centurion can actually do some stuff this time. I wanna deploy this Spearman. I like that he has a pretty good movement range. And um, he also has some distance attack and true strike. So as we get up here towards Ark, Bokeh, then I really would like him to be able to hit him because he gets to ignore his first basic attack, but true strike means that his attack counts as an alternate attack if I want it to, and I do. So let's put the Spearman out here. I'm actually gonna go ahead and put him here so that he can use his next move turn to try to pop right up onto one of these, um, one of these, one of these stones. We'll see how it goes. Arc Bokeh will want to move this way, so we'll see. Now, um, he's gonna just kind of sit because he doesn't have anything that lets him move or attack on that first deployment turn. He's deployed, he's gonna chill for a minute. The Centurion, however, is gonna get to start doing his thing. So what I wanna do with him is see how he really only has one move. We gave him a tactic called Adrenaline. 
that lets him have a higher than that move range. His move range is up by one, so he's at two. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna come shove Korikos off of this elevated tile. So take that Korikos, we're gonna go over here, one, and then two. We're gonna shove her directly backwards with our shove ability, which is a move ability. Then we're going to attack her with this green die. So the way that the turn works is you deploy, then you move, which we just did, and then you attack. So now the Centurion is gonna be able to attack Korikos. He's also what's called elevated. So if Korikos can hit her from, I mean, if uh, my Centurion can hit Korikos from where he is, he will not only hit her for the one hit on the die, but for a second hit. So theoretically, we can take Korikos totally out right now. We'll have to see. So let's see how we roll. And we got a hit. So that means that we hit Korikos and then we also got her for one extra hit because we were up on a pedestal. So the elevated skill, according to the back of the rulebook, does plus one damage with a successful basic attack to another unit that is not elevated. So we were able to hit her for an extra damage. So Korikos is out. We got her out of the game and that was our turn. So now we're gonna go to Arik Boke, we're gonna roll his dice and see what he does. Whoa. Okay, so this is an interesting roll because our dude doesn't move. Okay, so he didn't get a hit on the green die, which means he's not gonna move. He's gonna stay right where he is, which means that he won't be able to heave my guy. If he had moved here, which he would have had he gotten a move because he would have moved towards an arena stone and also towards the closest unit. So he didn't move, which means he's not gonna get to heave me off. So heave, from what I understand, it's actually, it's not actually mentioned on the back of the rule book. It just says heave strongest opposing adjacent unit on an arena hex directly overhead if possible. What that would probably mean from what I've gone, gotten to understand from Board Game Geek is that if he were here, he'd basically pick this dude up and just pew, throw him behind him, like off of a contested space. But he doesn't actually get to do that because he didn't move. So he also doesn't get to do an arena knockback and he doesn't get to do a basic attack. So Arik Boke just accidentally handed us a little bit of an advantage for this turn. So now that we're at the beginning of our turn, we're actually gonna score an arena point. So I just put us both at six. I'm gonna say that this is his arena score, here's ours. So we're up to one because we've begun the turn with one of our people on the stone. So that's pretty good for us. Now we're gonna get a little bit bold. So we're gonna get to deploy, then move, and then attack. And what we need to do is come after Arik Boke. That's what I wanna do anyway. So we'll see how it goes. Okay, so let's come in and go after him. What is the best way to do that? Let's take a risk. I wanna deploy this tactician and I'm gonna give him the dodge ability for this round so that he gets at least one hit in before he dies. Tacticians don't have a lot of life, but they do have a lot of movement. And he has a special ability called initiative, which means that rather than wait a whole turn after deployment to move, he can move right away, which means that I can put him out here and put him onto one of these stones, which is what I wanna do. So our tactician is out with his one round tactic. Here's what I want to do, I think. I am going to move him one, two, Three. So he's right next to Arik Boke. And the reason I want to do that is so that if he does move my tactician, heave him out of the way and come up here, then I can actually use my centurion to shove him away. Um, I'm also going to move my spearman here. One, two. So my spearman can actually attack Arik Boke, which my centurion really can't. The first basic attack that um, that hits him, he could ignore. So there's really no point in me using my Centurion to attack him when I can tactically be somewhere that might help me push him off of one of these stones instead. So I think what I wanna do is just move my Spearman up here. Now we can attack. The Tactician cannot attack, but he does have a special skill called Strategic Attack. It's an innate ability that allows my Spearman to add an extra yellow die to his attack roll. And because the Spearman has True Strike, we can treat his attack as an alternate attack, which means that our Boke cannot parry it. So we are gonna roll one blue and two yellow die and see what happens. Okay, so we got two hits against Arik. 
So he is gonna lose two of his six health and he is down to four, which isn't too bad. So now our guys have gone and it's his turn to do something. What I'm hoping is that he won't be able to do enough to get both of these guys off and I'll score three more positional points at the beginning of next round, if I'm lucky, we'll see. Okay, so our bucket is going to move according to this little handy dandy thing and he's also going to heave. So let's move him first. So he's going to move because he had a hit. Um, so logically speaking, he needs to move towards an arena hex, towards the closest opponent, opposing unit, and then towards the weakest opposing unit. There's a lot of options he has for that. Really the weakest opposing unit is here. It's still equidistant from um, an arena hex. So let's say that he's gonna move here. I'm using this to my advantage because I know he's moving and I have some choices based on this about where he's going to move. Because the weakest, the weakest opposing unit is what's gonna determine his ability to move this way. I'm actually glad I put my tactician there. Because then what he's gonna to attempt to do is he's going to attempt to heave him. However, the problem is that he can't because there is no hex that's immediately behind him. If he'd been here still, he would have just heaved my spearman back behind him, but he can't because he moved towards the weakest unit, which fortunately has a tactic on him this turn anyway. So if he'd attacked him, nothing would have happened. Um, and that's that. So he actually moved and then did not get to heave my guy because the heave is only triggered overhead if possible if he can flip him back over his head, which he can't because this is the edge of the arena. And there aren't rules for like throwing someone into the edge and doing that kind of damage. Okay, so that is that for our bokeh's turn. So now it's my go and I'm gonna get two three, four, I'm gonna get three more points because three of my people are on these hexes. So I'm up to four points and now I'm gonna start my turn. So I'm gonna just go ahead and deploy this attacker. I'm gonna put him like here, that seems pretty good. So he's got three health. So here are my three health and my attacker. My tactician is gonna lose his tactic because it was for only one round and he is now vulnerable. And now we can move and we can attack. Hmm, okay, so since I have four points here, I think what I'm gonna do is actually something a little bit risky. So I have two choices right now. I can either try to hold this and see if I can keep two guys on these arena spaces and get to six next time, which I think is pretty possible. Or I can decide to try to attack Arc Bokeh and then just try to end it this turn. You know what, we're just playing around. Let's see what we can do. So here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna take my, what's the best way to do this? Okay, I'm going to take my Centurion and I'm gonna use Shove to push Arc Boki back and move in to his spot. Because remember I have extra movement. I'm gonna take my Spearman down this way with his two move. And I'm gonna move my Tactician here. So what I'm gonna do is because I know this is one hit, no roll, and that the tactician can increase everybody's roll by one yellow die, ooh, what's the smartest thing to do? So the first basic attack is gonna be ignored by Arc Bokeh. So I can either use my one hit, no roll for that, or I, yeah, that's, or I can like roll this Centurion's dice, but I could maybe get two hits, and this is a guaranteed one. You know what, no guts, no glory. So my tactician's gonna do one hit, no roll, it's a guaranteed hit against Arc Book, except that he's going to parry it. We can only parry one basic attack hit per turn. Now, these guys get to attack. The Centurion can attack using one green die, and because the Tactician has an innate ability called Strategic Attack, he's able to also roll a yellow die. So let's see how he does. Oh, yes. Okay, so we rolled two hits. So that puts Arik Voke down to two. And then it's gonna be my Spearman's turn. He gets to roll one blue and two yellow dice because he also is adjacent to the tactician that has the innate strategic attack ability. So let's see if we can knock him out. Nope, that sucked. Okay, so sadly, um, <laughs> uh, he got zero hits against Arik Voke. Arik Voke still has two life. And he's gonna get to move against us and we'll see how that goes. Right, so here's Arc's roll. 
All right, so that was worthless. So basically he tried to move, couldn't move, got frustrated, and then didn't do anything else. So I guess he couldn't have heaved anyway, but he could absolutely have pushed us away from him if he had rolled a hit here and didn't. And he also did not attack. So that was a weirdly lucky roll for us. So now it's Argo again. We don't have anyone to deploy. I'm just gonna pop the attacker right up here uh, for movement. And then, hmm, you know what? I'm just gonna leave everybody here. We're gonna go, we're gonna go after Argo again one more time. So the tactician's gonna do the same thing as last time. He's gonna give one hit against him that gets ignored. Then my centurion is going to try a basic attack with a yellow die added one more time. Yeah, sorry that die fell off the table. Okay, so that would be one hit. So Boke has one life left. And then we're gonna roll one blue and two yellow for our spearman who gets an extra die because he's also next to the tactician. Okay, so that is two not hits, but one hit. One hit is all we needed. Arc Bokeh has been conquered, and that is the first solo trial. So once you've beaten the first one, you just move on to the second one. There will be new rules for that. So next time, we would know that we're drafting again for the Xanadu Arena, but our draft is limited to five chips instead of six, and we get the same bad guys plus somebody else. So if you thought the first trial was easy, the second one is here to remind you that maybe it's not that easy. So I hope that you guys get a sense of how fun it is to work your way up these solo challenges. Um, they're really, really enjoyable. They're really, really hard. And this is the most probably financially accessible Hoplomachus game. So if this looks good to you and you want quick, strategic, tactical games, this is a great choice. Um, I hope that you enjoyed this brief intro and happy gaming.